Good morning. Welcome, everyone, to this joint session between PRI guidance and investor education. Uh, my name is Anthony Roberts. I'm director of investor education at the PRI. Over this conference, we've been hearing a lot about what are the obstacles to moving from commitment to action. And we believe one of the most significant obstacles is a skills gap that exists. And we consider that the provision of training, education, and delivering impactful solutions that support our signatories in turning those commitments into actions are critical. And one of the ways we're doing this is to integrate more closely our guidance team, who creates the, the guidance that helps support how to turn our policy and deep research into uh, products and services for investors to understand what that means as they're developing their policies, and the education team which support the bottom-up approach of helping people across organizations understand how to apply that in their day-to-day -day work. So we think this is a critical factor in helping move from commitment to action. So this session is uh, one which is jointly between those two, two parts of the PRI. And in this session, we will be exploring uh, financial analysis in alternatives, specifically looking at communication through the investment chain and what limited partners and allocators need to know in order to effectively select, appoint, and monitor general partners. And thinking that top-down, bottom-up approach, you can have the most fantastic ESG strategies and policies in the world, but unless you can communicate those to clients through DDQs and so on, uh, they won't understand what you're doing, they won't understand your approach to responsible investment, and they therefore may not win those capital, uh, the capital inflows that you're seeking. Equally, if you're an asset allocator or owner, you need to be able to understand and communicate effectively with your managers as to how they're approaching ESG challenges. So we'll be exploring that uh, communication chain. Uh, and at the end of this session, I'd also like to introduce a, a new product that we've been developing in the investor education uh, team. Uh, so everyone in this room will get an opportunity to build on the insights and learning from this session with a special online module that we've developed uh, and a follow-up session which will allow you to build uh, on what you've discussed today. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, your chair for this session, Natasha Buckley. Natasha is Vice President of ESG at Harbourvest Partners. She joined Harbourvest in 2019 uh, and is responsible for sustaining the firm's ESG strategy, partnering with general partners, limited partners, and the employees across the organization to embrace sustainable investing. I'm delighted to say Natasha joined Harbourvest from the PRI, <laughs> where she was involved in some of the practical development of those tools and education products to support the integration of ESG factors across uh, the investment chain. Natasha, thank you. Thanks. Right. <laughs> <No. laughs> Thanks, Anthony. All right. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today back at PRI in person. And I'm delighted to introduce uh, the panel we have today to, to discuss this important topic. Uh, we have Tatsuya Hayashi, uh, founding partner of Unison Capital, uh, Lisa McDonald, head of uh, responsible investments for Aware Super, Lane Zhao, who is founder and CEO of Innovision Capital, and Calvin Kwan, managing director of sustainability and risk governance for Linkrete. Uh, so can I ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves to kick us off? Uh, tell us a little bit about your firm so that we can understand the perspectives that you're bringing to us today. And can I also ask you to highlight one or two characteristics of responsible investment in your local alternatives market, uh, regulatory or otherwise? And so we'll start with, uh, with the host country, Japan. Uh, Hayashi-san, uh, please can you tell us a bit about Unison Capital and what characterizes responsible investment in the Japanese alternatives market? Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, and welcome to Tokyo. Um, I'm not with uh, uh, Nippon Life, so uh, I'm not in the hosting uh, position. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I'm happy to welcome you guys from uh, all over the world. Um, I am Tatsuya Hayashi. Uh, I'm one of the uh, founding partners at Unison Capital. Uh, we've been, uh, we, ha we have uh, established in, uh, back in 1998. And uh, uh, since then, we have been doing a private equity investment uh, in Japan. And afterwards, uh, we expanded uh, our strategy into uh, Korea. Uh, but anyway, uh, I have been uh, involved in the Japanese private equity uh, business in, in the last uh, 25 years. 
um, you know, we were one of the, uh, the very few first group uh, who started uh, this business uh, in Japan. Uh, since then, uh, the private equity industry has uh, developed significantly. Um, by the way, uh, I had been uh, chairing the uh, Japan Private Equity Association uh, up, at, and up until last month. And now uh, the membership yeah, uh, you know, amongst the GPs are now exceeding uh, 60. Um, you know, when we started, just two. So uh, it's a significant development uh, over the uh, uh, quarter of the century. Uh, however, uh, one of the uh, most significant ca uh, characteristics of Japanese private equity market is the size of the transaction is small. Um, you know, you can uh, see uh, a couple of notable, uh, you know, uh, huge transactions of a billion, billions of dollars. That's uh, basically led by uh, global uh, PE firms uh, based, uh, based in, uh, in Japan. And uh, most of the uh, uh, transactions uh, in Japan are still in the range of uh, 100 million US to uh, 500. It's a small to mid cap. So, um, it, it, including ourselves, <coughs> uh, we, we're playing in that field. So uh, when it comes to uh, ESG, um, you know, we have to be careful in pursuing that agenda uh, with uh, our portfolio companies. You know, uh, if you deal with the, um, you know, uh, the global company, Japanese company, but, but global company backed by uh, global uh, sponsors, then you, know, you can easily go into the, uh, uh, you know, and tackle the, try to tackle the uh, environmental uh, issues or you know, human rights issues, uh, including the, the you know logistics, you know lines, uh, uh, you know at home and abroad immediately because they have a readiness and resources. But uh, you know when trying to deal with small to mid cap companies, domestic ones, uh, you know they are not there yet. And we are not uh, there yet. So uh, rather than environmental agenda. Uh, we tend to uh, put, uh, you know, um, a human agenda. agenda. So uh, rather than, uh, you know, E, you know, probably S would be the right uh, spot uh, to start. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, um, uh, we knew um, you know, Japanese G GPs, uh, you know, through our own experiences, we knew that uh, addressing people's motivation and morale uh, who are, are working at the front line of their operation is a key uh, to produce, uh, you know, decent uh, growth on the business and uh, returns on our investment. So uh, I'd like, uh, you know, later on, if I have a chance, I I'd like to uh, share some of the uh, examples but uh, you know, uh, you know, in answering uh, the, uh, the question, you know, we need to be uh, careful uh, in what order uh, we place uh, amongst the uh, ESG agenda uh, uh, in action. Absolutely, thank you, Lane. Innovation Capital was formed in 2016 with a specific focus on green economy sectors in China and Asia more broadly. So what are the broader responsible investment characteristics in this region that made that a particularly attractive segment for you when, when starting the firm? Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Lane Zhao. I'm the founder and CEO of Innovation Capital. And actually, before Innovation Capital, uh, I was a very early team member for KKR in entire Asia. I was KKR's second local hire in entire Asian market. I stayed at KKR for 11 years, and I led many of the early investments for KKR in the ESC spectrum, right? So today, Innovation Capital, we are focusing on uh, the ESC sectors, and particularly, we have a focus on the whole green energy uh, clean tech spectrum that includes things like EV supply chain, battery supply chain, solar, energy storage, hydrogen, waste, wastewater treatment, waste management, energy saving, the whole spectrum. Uh, and I think, you know, over the last many years, many of our portfolios became multiple billion US dollar market, uh, market cap companies, and uh, they are still growing very rapidly today. Um, and many of them have potential to grow into even bigger scale. Um, I think our view here is uh, really, I mean, if you really look at the whole green economy sector today, um, you know, uh, uh, it's quite different now versus before, um, you know, uh, it kind of, it kind of today combines that hyper growth 
uh, in the market, attract a return profile we can generate for the investors, and the massive carbon reduction uh, impact we can create as well. So I mean, so this is actually very different versus before, right? I mean, let me give you some figures. For example, you know, uh, for the uh, uh, global EV market, right? I mean, if you look at the China market, the penetration for passenger EV last year, uh, as of now, is already over 30%, okay? Global market, X China, is single digit. So there is massive potential for enormous potential for that penetration to continue to grow. If you really look at commercial EV, which contributes to more carbon um, pollution, um, you know, for the transportation sector, a commercial EV in China, the penetration today is 10%, the highest globally. And globally, non X China, the penetration is probably 1%. So what does that mean? That basically means that penetration will continue to grow. Okay, so for the whole sector, there will be the penetration one day will be over 50%. It sometimes is, is uh, uh, you know, the EV, the hybrid, the hydrogen, different type of uh, new energy vehicles. Uh, one day the penetration will be over 50% or even 100% one day, right? So, so that basically means the whole sector, already very big industry today, still has five, 10, or even uh, 10 times potential to grow over the next decade or two. So I think that's really the enormous growth potential we're looking at. So last year, I mean, uh, maybe a question for all the audience here. Uh, last year, the global market, right, for the EV sector, what's the growth rate? I mean, if you believe that's over 30%, raise your hand. Okay, all right. Just an, a few of them, okay, that's great. So uh, you guys are right. Okay, last year for the whole EV market, global market, the growth was 48%. The think about it, it's already a massive, very big sector. And the whole industry growth was 48% last year. Penetration, as I mentioned, is passenger vehicle is below 10%. Um, in China, it's 30 plus percent. Commercial vehicle globally, X China, is something like 1%. Okay, so there is massive potential for that to grow. So I think that's really quite different, right? I mean, if you really look at, uh, I would just give one example. Um, one of our portfolios is called Lu Kong, right? I mean, that's the power transmission system provider for commercial EVs. The biggest one in China, they, they are probably the best in the world as well. They're exporting right now to uh, Southeast Asia, Korea, Japan. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, 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 Europe, US will be the target market going forward as well. Um, you know, they are growing very rapidly. Uh, they have dominant market position, number one player uh, in that whole sector. Um, and really look at the, the growth. I mean, they're growing at more than 50% per annum right now. Okay, but I think the carbon emission reduction uh, they are generating is also quite significant. I mean, this year themselves, not only themselves, but also the downstream, the trucks, the EVs, they're selling to the market, right? I mean, the total carbon emission reduction this year alone in the supply chain they create is 700 uh, grand uh, uh, tens of uh, carbon reduction, okay? And five years, because they're growing very fast, five years from now, they have potential to uh, achieve 5 million carbon reduction per annum. You know, in the in the industry value chain. So actually, that's actually very different right now. So that's really the point I mentioned earlier. We are seeing the beginning of the new era for green economy, um, um, and the whole world. My view is the whole world going green. That trend is inevitable, and that's creating enormous amount of investment opportunities for GP like us. So we're combining that hyper growth, attractive return potential and also massive carbon reduction they can achieve uh, in the market at the same time. So I think, you know, that's really sort of uh, our view on the market today. Mm -hmm. Exciting. Okay, thank you. Calvin, could you introduce us to, to LinkRead as the largest real estate investment trust in <coughs> Asia and also responsible investment characteristics that inform real estate strategy in Hong Kong? Natasha, thanks for the time. Um, it's certainly not as interesting as EVs. <laughs> yeah. you know, real estate, I think everybody understands this and knows this. Um, but real estate is still that really, that traditional approach to, to investing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's common across the various geographies. 
So for Link, um, we are the largest real estate investment trust in Asia. Uh, we started off primarily in Hong Kong or only in Hong Kong. Uh, and over the last 15 years, we've actually expanded throughout Asia Pacific, uh, mainland China, uh, Australia, and also most recently in Singapore. Uh, we manage primarily uh, we manage primarily the uh, mid market um, shopping centers. Uh, some office spaces have expanded into logistics, and some of this is based on economic changes uh, in the particular region itself. Um, one of the key things that we're still focusing on right now is is really just decarbonization. Uh, and a lot of this reason is because the jurisdictions that we're in, mm -hmm. China, Singapore, Hong Kong, Australia, um, the policies around decarbonization, energy efficiency in buildings is evolving very, very quickly um, and it continues to do so. Uh, for example, over in Singapore, they already have, uh, you know, platinum certification systems, but they're already talking about uh, super low energy buildings. Mm -hmm. And that's being rolled out over the next five years. Uh, the issue for a building owner um, is that if we build or retrofit a building to today's building standards uh, within the next three to five years, we already imagine the building codes will be changing. And therefore, a platinum building today might only be a gold, might not even be gold um, three to five years from now. That means that our properties may not be uh, attractive for some of our tenants. So how do we start managing these issues and, and dealing with those challenges? Um, and that's been one of the key drivers uh, for what we're doing. The other thing I'd like to mention really quickly, uh, as this is really about the communication side, um, over the last 11 years, uh, one thing unique about Link is that we actually don't have a majority uh, owner. So unlike the family businesses that some of you are familiar with, uh, our largest unit holder holds probably 2% uh, of Link. Um, where our investors are spread across Europe, America, Asia Pacific. And what that means is that over the last 11 years, I've had to learn from a lot of our uh, business partners on what are the key issues that you're focused on within your specific region. Uh, what are the issues that are coming up in Europe are different from the concerns over in America, different from the current concerns coming up in Asia Pacific. And we've had to learn how to balance some of these interests. Um, some KPIs are more important than others and, and how does that affect our strategy? Mm -hmm. I'll share a little bit about that a uh, later on. Okay, great. I actually remember hearing you speak, I think, years ago at PRI in person Singapore, and you were talking about it's um, waiting for the tipping point where, where sustainability becomes that investment value driver. And it sounds like sounds like we got there in, in the meantime. There, yeah. yeah. So, um, so finally, going to, to Lisa. So you're representing asset owners on this panel and also the Australian market, which we know has some of the highest standards when it comes to responsible investment. Uh, we've heard from um uh, from the panel which we'll probably go into to next but first could you could you speak to how those those market characteristics of australia have shaped your approach to alternatives investments yeah um great thanks natasha apologies for my voice unfortunately i can't say it's from karaoke <laughs> um i wish i could but um i was tucked home in bed while a lot of my friends were out at the karaoke yeah. bars last night so um hopefully i get through this okay so um thanks very much uh for having me and so um, I'm here to represent and hold these guys to account, I guess, and, and all of the fund managers in the room as well. So Aware Super is a $160 billion asset owner. We're the third largest in Australia. We represent and invest the retirement savings of 1.1 million members. Our members are predominantly, predominantly what we term the carers of the community, uh, nurses, teachers, fire, ambulance um, and aged care. So very much frontline workers. Um, from an Australian perspective, um, we have a number, we invest in every asset class that exists. So we've got public markets, but then we've also got infrastructure, property, private equity, direct credit. So we do have um, a large component of alternatives in our portfolio. We also manage money internally and externally across um, our asset classes. Um, the mix at the moment is around 30% internally and 70% externally, and that will grow to be more external over time. Um, we have over 120 fund managers across all of our asset classes. Um, so there's a lot of communication with all of our um, GPs and fund managers that we have in ensuring that how they're incorporating ESG into their investment practices 
is meeting our expectations. Um, so, and I'll go, we'll sort of delve a bit deeper into that um, a little bit later as well. I think the evolution that we've seen thinking about how we assess managers, um, when we first started off, all of our assets were externally managed. So we have an, a manager selection appointment process. But what we've had to evolve is as we own assets directly, um, and particularly in property and infrastructure, we need to have our own due diligence processes and materiality frameworks. So we've need needed to build those internally and do the work ourselves and not have a GP to rely on. And then an extension of that and the evolution of that has been around, we now have a direct asset management team. So once we own the asset, we're embedding our RO principles, our responsible ownership principles into the assets that we own. And that crosses diversity, safety, cyber security, emissions reduction plans. So we've got lots of touch points with our assets and managers. And I think communicating with all of them is really important so they understand our expectations and what we want from them but equally we need to be able to communicate to our members in terms of what we're investing in and and how we're investing and what that looks like from one the return perspective but then also in terms of the environmental and social outcomes we're having with the assets that we invest in mm. okay well let's stick on the theme of, of allocating to managers and we've heard from from the panel um, with smaller transactions, you need to be strategic when it comes to ESG. We've heard about the value creation opportunity with with the green transition. We've heard that from the manager side, you know, you have all these different um, stakeholder, shareholder, investor um, expectations, requirements that you have to have to calibrate as well. So, as as I guess one LP in a fund and and um, and across many different managers, what's what's the structure that you've set up? to incorporate ESG into to your financial analysis of alternatives and uh, manager selection? And how has that evolved over time as, as maybe you take some of these sensitivities into account? Yeah, thanks, Natasha. I'll I'll focus on private equity because that's probably where we've got the most managers. Um, as I talked about, our infrastructure and property will go more internal. So we've got a number of managers, but I think our PE, pro, our PE program has over 30 external fund managers. And um, with a number of those, what we like to do is allocate to probably smaller um, GPs have some ownership rights, um, be able to sit on the LPAC boards um, and then be able to influence. Um, and we also like to get the co-invest opportunities so that we're, we're getting um, more allocation um, and less fees. Just got to put it out there in terms of the fees as an asset owner. And so for even for every asset class, the way we approach managers, you, you can't have a one size fits all. Every manager invests differently and we expect every manager to be investing differently. So whilst our due diligence process and framework is the same, we think about materiality, we think about the style of the manager that we're trying to appoint and we've got to evolve our process internally and how we look at that as well. The other thing that we found over time is what we expected back in 2014 is very different to what we expect now. Um, so our, our GPs and our fund managers that we want to allocate capital have got to be very aligned to the outcomes that we're trying to achieve as well. So it's been very much a, um, a journey and we're looking for those fund managers um, that really want to, um, I guess, get the outcomes that we want as well. Our PE team spent um, like a whole year last year looking for, um, natural, um, for climate related solutions. So um, it's not my team doing that and I think that's the evolution from an RI team working with our investment team is our fund managers or our portfolio managers are allocating the capital. They need to understand all the risks and all of the financial implications in their portfolio. I don't own the ESG risk in their, in their portfolio, they do. So we've spent a lot of time with them over the last year as well, ensuring that they're able to do their own manager due diligence and assessment, but then also the assessments on the co-invest that we have as well. So, And we're acting more as a subject matter experts and we'll get more involved when there might be some nuances that we might need to delve a little bit deeper into, particularly where it might um, be around modern slavery or some issues that we really need a number of um, expertise in. So it, it, it's evolved. And I think, you know, we can't sit and set and forget either. It, everything is changing out there and we're expecting our managers to be on top of things as well. Yeah. Hi, Ashi-san. I believe your, most of your limited partner clients are, are Japanese investors. So from, from your perspective, after hearing uh, leases, how are 
uh, Japanese LPs approaching the topic of responsible investment and and has that changed over time? What what trends are you noticing? Thank you. Um, yes. Um, well, uh, another uh, no, notable uh, characteristics characteristics of uh, a Japanese private equity investment is the uh, the LPs are not in general not um, you know having a, a long experience yet. Uh, when we you know started our first fund uh, back in 1998, uh, there were uh, just a few uh, Japanese LPs. Uh, who had a uh, track record of uh, investing in, in this arena uh, elsewhere, right? And, uh, you know, they had uh, been experienced in overseas market, in private equity world. Uh, so uh, we had, uh, you know, uh, quite a um, good amount of uh, feedback or advice from them uh, in terms of uh, fund operation and GP operation and so on. And, uh, you know, as I said, as, I, uh, as the uh, private equity market in Japan has evolved uh, recently, uh, you know, the vast majority of Japanese LPs are you know, experienced in less than a decade or so. Right? So uh, when it comes to uh, ESG agenda, uh, you know, uh, we uh, as GPs are not you know, easily depending up upon their experience or otherwise. So, uh, you know, we at Inson, uh, you know, decided to, uh, you know, build a framework of our own. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, uh, we are basically dealing with the small to mid-cap uh, companies. So uh, uh, we, we set uh, two layers of a CDE. Uh, first, CDE is uh, a community, diversity, and empowerment. That's all human um, or people related uh, agenda first. Then uh, uh, the second layer is uh, carbon, disposables, and energy. Uh, when, you know, the, even the employees and management at um, <coughs> local city uh, of a small businesses, uh, you know, they are you know, aware, aware of the, uh, the sustainability is the thing. And you know, if there is something, uh, anything, you know, they would be involved in. But uh, you know, it's not you know easy for them to digest uh, within their business daily operations uh, on those uh, those agen agenda. Uh, so uh, you know, we always start with the people issues. Uh, you know, as a shareholder, uh, controlling mm -hmm. with, uh, with with controlling power. Uh, you know, we start with the uh, initiatives to, uh, you know, treat the, the people uh, at the front line of their operations better. So, uh, you know, those taking those steps, uh, we can gradually, um, uh, you know, uh, gain the ex an expanded uh, recognition of the importance of these agendas. And, uh, you know, second layer, you know, the C of CDE cannot be, you know, imposed uh, at first day. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, that's one, one approach. Uh, the, the second approach uh, is uh, um, the cross line. Uh, you know, we are uh, handling, uh, you know, maybe a dozen or so of uh, uh, investee companies uh, at any time. So once we can uh, make a significant progress, or you know, uh, we, we we can uh, develop uh, develop uh, uh, a good example uh, that can be shared with other investing companies, then you know we can you know uh, coordinate those um, uh, uh, events or occasions so that you know, portfolio companies can you know uh, you know interactively learn uh, you know what can be done and how. Not from uh, you know uh, sponsors' viewpoint, but from their peers' viewpoint. That's a very powerful tool uh, to drive uh, a sustainability agenda at the uh, uh, portfolio company level. And third, so, uh, yet you know uh, interaction or dialogue uh, uh, between GP and LP are crucial, obviously. And uh, um, you know, we GPs uh, of private, private equity is uh, groundwork. You know, on the ground, uh, we are tackling with the, um, you know, 
daily issues of the portfolio company's uh, operational you know, challenges and the, you know, problems every day. And uh, so we have sort of a bug's eye type of a <laughs> uh, ground worker. On the other hand, LPs uh, ha have uh, bird's eye. They have a you know, much broader exposure uh, to uh, you know, so many uh, managers all over the world. So uh, they are you know, in the most advanced position uh, in uh, observing uh, 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 the, you know, uh, progressive uh, cases uh, elsewhere. So uh, if they can share their own you know, such cases with, with us, uh, that would be beneficial mm -hmm. mutually. Mm -hmm. So uh, this dialogue uh, between uh, GP and LP are uh, quite important, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, um, as I said, you know, relatively inexperienced um, uh, LPs tend to ask, uh, you know, GPs for, uh, you know, standardized set of numerical data, right? Uh, it's not wrong at all. Uh, they are entitled to ask for it, and uh, we should provide that. Um, but uh, GPs, as ground worker, uh, they want to tell the story, tell you the story, <laughs> what's happening, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, what the struggle and the challenges and the triumph uh, we're making on the ground with, uh, the, you know, in the interaction with the, uh, the portfolio companies you know, uh, in, the in the context of ESG. So bear with it. Uh, here, uh, your GPs tell their you know, story <laughs> willingly. And then, you know, you can check the reality uh, with the data afterwards. Yeah. That would be a very you know, beneficial <laughs> uh, way of conversation between GP and LP. Yeah, absolutely agree. Um, Lane, you've, you've spoken to um, sort of the, the deal activity and the opportunity side, uh, the opportunity on the deal side, but... You were at KK Asia, you say, for 11 years before you started Innovision in, in 2016. So what, what are your broader observations on the capital supply from, from investors? Like what's different now from 10, 15 years ago, and uh, which, which caused you, I guess, to, to launch this as a dedicated strategy? Okay. Uh, good question, right? I mean, uh, I initially, at KK Asia days, I led all the early efforts investments in the ESC spectrum in Asia. Um, I still remember the first investment we made was 2011 uh, in the green energy clean tech space that's a membrane technology provider in Singapore, uh, providing that for the wastewater treatment industry in the entire Asian market. Uh, when we made the investment, I remember when we presented that to the IC, before the meeting, when I was talking to half of the, my colleagues internally, I think half of the colleagues were asking me, hey, Lane, just tell me what ESC stands for, right? I mean, so remember, I mean, that was really early days. Uh, but I think at that time we got that vision. We believe, I believe that this is going to be something really important, uh, you know, going forward. Uh, so I think, you know, we started investing into green energy, clean tech uh, since 2011. And the company, United Invertech, that's a membrane technology company in Singapore, uh, they grew from small scale into global number one. And later on, we sold that business at almost two billion US dollar valuation to a strategic buyer. That was one of the most successful investments for KKR Asia Fund One, and still by today, probably the most, uh, one of, at least one of the most successful investments for KKR in the Asian market. Um, and I think you know, uh, and what's different now versus before is I think we thought. You know, I think that's a question being raised by um, a lot of LPs globally, right? I mean, uh, um, you know, what's different now versus 10, 15 years ago investing into green energy, clean tech? I think the difference right now is there are three game-changing factors uh, over the last 10 decade, uh, over the last decade that happened to this sector, completely change the game, right? So the factor number one is technology development. So 12 years ago, uh, when we started investing into the sector, there was no EV. There was no battery, right? There was no energy storage. There was no technology breakthrough like that. So that actually changed the game. Uh, that's a game changer factor number one. The game changing factor number two is significant cost down. So when those suppliers, you know, globally uh, achieve massive scale, they are able to manage cost down significantly through the industry value chain. So right now, a lot of those green energy products are not 
greener but more expensive, it is greener, better, and cheaper. Okay, so that completely changed the game. Okay, so if you really look at EVs, for example, you know, um, you know, Tesla or BYD or many other brands in China, they are always able to cost down. They're providing better products, cheaper products. Okay, and the greener at the same time. Same situation for solar industry. If you combine solar together with energy storage, it's much cheaper than traditional energy source like uh, oil and the gas uh, power stations, right? So, so I think you know that really changed the game significantly. That's the second game-changing factor. The third game-changing factor is really, especially after the Russian-Ukraine war, I think almost every single major country in the world realized the energy independence is very important for their economy. Mm -hmm. And energy sovereignty is every single country's goal right now. Mm -hmm. And I think renewable will help all the major economies become more and more energy independent. Because once they build up that infrastructure, you do not need to buy sunshine from anybody else. You do not need to buy wind from anybody else. You become more energy independent. So I think those, if you really combine those three factors together, that completely changed the game. So right now, what we are seeing is, as I mentioned, the sector is growing very rapidly, very fast. Uh, and it does, a lot of the sectors does not need subsidy anymore. The EVs, you know, the commercial EVs, solars, um, you know, today, I mean, probably some economy needs to subsidize the petrol and the gas power stations, not the solar farms anymore, right? So I think, you know, that's actually very different. So I think from that perspective, we believe the, the whole world going green, that trend is inevitable, okay? So, and that's creating very interesting opportunities, right? I mean, uh, another example, you know, the United Invertech, the membrane technology company, as I mentioned, uh, after we sold that business, the management team also sold their stake. Uh, so that's a, the, the founder became billionaire, and his family office is my LP right now, our LP right now. And uh, they started a new business in Singapore, providing that AI technology for wastewater treatment industry, energy saving sector as well. Okay, so th they have the global cutting edge AI technology in that sector, um, serving the entire Asian market. Um, and growing, they are tripling the revenue this year, and probably more than doubling the revenue next year as well, growing very fast. At the same time, they're helping the downstream wastewater uh, treatment facilities <laughs> reduce the carbon emission by 30% by using their AI technology. And that's massive carbon emission reduction, right? I mean, this year itself, they're gonna help their clients reduce carbon emission by 200 uh, kilo tons uh, of carbon emission. And they're growing very fast. So I think in the next few years, they're going to be over 1 million ton uh, carbon emission reduction uh, through their supply chain, um, you know, uh, in their sector. Um, so I think, you know, so I mean, that's example showing technology breakthrough and the sc scale they can achieve and what kind of, you know, the climate, positive climate impact they can create, um, you know, uh, in their sector as well. Okay, so great. I think that's quite different now. Brilliant. All right. So lots of opportunity. And, and Calvin, you, you spoke to the decarbonization opportunity and what sustainable the value sustainability focus can bring to Linkreet's holdings. How are you communicating that value to, to your investors, to your owners and shareholders? Well, so one of the first things that we've been doing a lot more of now, uh, be, even before COVID, was um, doing some of these ESG NDR, you know, NDR roadshows uh, and just to align on what the expectations are. So Lisa mentioned this a little bit. It's really about understanding what your expectations are for me and better yet, letting you know how I intend to meet those expectations or if we're not able to, what's the gap and why is there that gap? Um, in, you know, 11 years ago when I first started, a lot of this was focused on the environmental side, which Hayashi-san has mentioned as well. Um, and we've seen this evolve over the last few years, social issues, governance issues. Um, and again, because of geo regional differences, um, key focuses in, in different areas. Uh, as I've mentioned, we don't have a major stakeholder. So then we have to manage this type of situation. And what we've ended up doing is kind of touch on all the spectrum of ESG issues. And we're starting to realize that by doing this, yes, we can meet um, the majority of investor expectations, right? But then it goes back to what Hayashi-san said as well, in the sense that we're doing all this, and then you have to collect the data to prove this as well. Mm -hmm. um, so far, it's like treading water. I can do it. 
Um, but as these expectations shift and change, it's going to be more in depth. Uh, we're going to need more information. And that's where we're going to get uh, that will uh, get uh, drawn thinner in regards to the expertise that we have, the skills that we have. Um, and I'm already foreseeing this. So one thing that we've decided to do is start to review what our thinking is on our sustainability strategy and how to communicate it. Instead of talking about ESG, uh, and one of the reasons for that is, you know, we would talk to the ESG analysts um, and then they would understand, but they're not necessarily the fund manager who will make the final decisions. Um, in the end, what we've realized is that, you know, we've made this a little too complicated. Um, this discussion sustainable to ESG is being too convoluted as well. Uh, let's focus on what's most important. And as a real estate investment trust, there really are only two things, um, very basic two things that are the most important. The first is that we can continue to, that we are able to provide you with strong distributions every year. That's the first, the returns. And the second thing that we have to focus on is ensuring the longevity of being able to provide those returns, right? So the returns that we provide and for how long. When we look at it from that perspective, it's actually start, it's a lot easier for us to start figuring out which are the ESG issues um, that are most important and that support either of these two areas. Um, and from that, it ties into being able to communicate some of our efforts back into the financial performance. So a lot of the environmental initiatives that we have, very easy to calculate ROIs, energy efficiency, cost savings, and so forth. Um, but then when you jump over to things like climate resilience, portfolio resilience, it's a little bit more fuzzy. Um, and that's where we have to start going to the sides of you know, insurance premiums, insurance costs. Um, and also, I've mentioned the example earlier about future fit buildings, right? How do we ensure that our buildings are going to, by investing now, we're meeting the future building standards. And then when the next lease cycles come up, the reversion can be, be higher. Um, and that's how we're starting to focus our ESG strategy um, and communication, uh, really looking at these two key areas. What does this initiative do? Does it, does it, what does this initiative do? Does it uh, help on the return side or does it help on the longevity side? And really, um, you know, connecting that with the financial performance. Yeah. What about tenants? How important is sustainability to tenants? And are there any variances or demographic trends that you're seeing in the types of tenants that are more focused on sustainability in yeah. their buildings? So I think we can break this down into the office tenants and retail tenants. Um, office tenants, I think that the demand from uh, office tenants is, is just you know, is accelerating. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this depends on who you want to bring into your property. Is it a MNC? Is it a government type of uh, entity? Because both of those typically will have requirements to lease only in certain uh, types of buildings, platinum buildings and so forth. And then again, I've mentioned already, you know, a platinum building today, three years from now, may not be platinum. It may not even be gold. Mm -hmm. uh, and then therefore you might lose that tenant out to someone else moving literally across the street. Um, so, so there is that strong demand from that side. On the retail side, uh, because we manage the kind of uh, non-discretionary retail, uh, a lot of smaller shops, um, it's, it hasn't been as fast. But what we are seeing is that some of the tenants, which are larger listed companies, right, they are having to respond to the regulatory bodies. They're having to do their climate disclosures and so forth. Um, so we're seeing that a lot of the uh, larger listed tenants are interested in these sustainability initiatives. They understand the energy management side, but they're more interested on the data sharing side. This has traditionally been one of the most difficult parts, you know, sharing data between tenants and landlords. Uh, tenants feel that if we give you too much data, you know too much about our operations, so you know what our profit margin is, therefore you can, you know, change the, the, the rental terms. Um, but realistically, it's about making the properties more efficient. Um, so, so now that listed tenants, they have to report their scope two emissions. Well, the tenants scope two emissions are our scope three emissions, our scope and, and vice versa. We need to start reporting our own scope three emissions. So we're doing a lot of the, we're doing uh, a lot of data sharing through green leases agreements um, to, to provide that information. And in return, we're also providing analysis for the tenants in terms of where are you performing in regards to your type of uh, space, the size, compared to other tenants within our portfolio uh, with, with similar industries as well. The smaller tenants uh, are probably going to still be more focused on the environmental initiatives, not so much on the social side, uh, but hopefully that will change shortly. Okay. The, I mean, Lisa, you're a direct investor in real estate as well. I mean, uh, can you comment here from, do you have anything to add here from the Australian perspective? Yeah, <clears throat> sorry. Um, uh, absolutely. Some of the property that we've done directly, 
um, in Europe, you know, we're seeing regulation coming in that if you're not meeting certain CREM standards, you won't be able to lease your buildings. So it is now becoming a financial imperative that we're factoring in how we've got sustainable buildings across our portfolio. And then that goes to any of the property managers that we're invested in and through as well, that they're looking at their portfolio and, and they're looking at that as well. Um, I, I wanted to touch on, you know, we talk a lot about solar and wind and electric electric vehicles and, and it's all great for emissions. I think from an asset owner perspective, one of the things we're starting to challenge our managers on is to make sure they're looking at the broader governance and social implications from that as well. When we think about modern slavery and we think about cultural heritage and First Nations and development. So I don't, I don't want to be the, you know, the negative Nancy in the room, but it, it's very much, we've got to think of, from an asset owner perspective, we're focused on how you're managing all of those risks when you're thinking about these investment decisions that you're making and they're all interconnected and they're all about value creation and we all want to make sure that we're getting those outcomes. Yeah, I see. Okay, so we do have a Q&A function here, but I've just got not a question, but just one comment from Matthew, pretty strong value creation. And I think we covered that um, quite nicely with with the um, first three quarters of the panel. So we've got 15 minutes left. Um, and we, I, I'd like to kind of stay on the topic of the invest manager relationship and the reporting. So we've heard that uh, we need to be able to, to understand materiality at the investment level. So we do need some standardized data to, to provide, I guess, evidence or, um, or, or insights. Uh, but, but really, the, the investor manager relationship works best when you're working together to produce better outcomes and you're really understanding the portfolio. So uh, taking that, uh, you know, and, and, and thinking also about how progress is being reported, you know, we do have a data challenge in private markets. Um, you know, Lisa, where you sit, yep. you're trying to in intersect this across all your different asset classes. So maybe we could get some brief comments from, <laughs> from the panel first about what, what the challenges are for them, but how they're solving for them. Um, and then and then hear from Lisa from more of the, the you know, from your position across the different asset classes, how, how um, alternatives is intersecting into your analysis. So we'll start with Hayashi-san again. Okay. Um, well, uh, th that's been a difficult part. Yeah, <laughs> for, uh, always. Yeah, for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we became uh, the PRI signatory back in uh, 2017. And since then, uh, we have been you know, reporting in the designated format. Um, but frankly, we were not confident that this was the uh, you know, right thing. <laughs> um, maybe right, but <laughs> not confident enough. Uh, and afterwards, you know, we saw a series of uh, new uh, data requirements and uh, disclosure rules uh, <coughs> coming out and merged, like uh, corporations. So uh, uh, we we're still uh, you know, uh, in the middle of a uh, mist. And uh, it seems like uh, other, you know, my peer uh, Japanese GPs uh, you know, uh, in the same kind of a mist. So uh, at some point, we decided to uh, pave our own path. Um, in two things, two ways. Uh, you know, first one is uh, we teamed up with, with uh, a Singapore-based uh, startup called RIM Sustainability, RIM, uh, R-I-M-M, -M, um, which is uh, you know, uh, trying to uh, provide the services for corporations and the funds uh, to uh, you know, effectively collect ESG data and compare with the you know, industry peers globally. And, uh, and assess it and uh, suggest uh, the next action to be taken. And uh, we uh, you know, made a small investment uh, there. And uh, you know, we uh, now, so in the, you know, in the process of uh, uh, co-developing um, the uh, a product for GPs so that you know, we can uh, you know, effectively collect uh, the standardized set of uh, the ESG data from you know, e each portfolio company and compare it and uh, suggest the next action. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, we can uh, take a whole picture at a glance. Uh, we're still in the process uh, of uh, the, the development. Uh, but once we, uh, you know, uh, have our own sort of a weapon <laughs> uh, to tackle with those challenges, uh, that would be beneficial. That, that, that's, that, that's one thing. The other thing is, uh, is uh, we, uh, last year we uh, joined the EDCI uh, as, um, uh, as first GP from Japan. Again, this is a, a kind of a challenging 
uh, maybe for the audio, the, the EDCI is the ESG Data Convergence Initiative. So yep. it was launched by, well, it now has a large Europa. group of maybe 250 uh, GPs are signed up uh, committing to reporting on a standardized set of ESG data metrics. Thank yeah. you for uh, 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 thank you for the uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, um, yes, and uh, you know it, it's a, it's it's a, again a tough uh, process uh, you know at uh, at front because you know uh, we have to try to adjust it mm -hmm. you know uh, our uh, disclosure uh, measurement, but uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know to get strength in the muscle, you know mm -hmm. uh, we should uh, <laughs> move on to uh, such kind of a challenge. So uh, in these two uh, things, we are trying to uh, uh, find our own, uh, you know, uh, way of collecting, analyzing, and disclosing uh, ESG data mm -hmm. uh, of our portfolio. To uh, once we got that, you know, uh, uh, we are confidently uh, communicate with our LPs, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, at least we can feel and we are doing the right thing by ourselves. Great. Okay, so we just have two minutes on this question from from Lane and then from uh, Calvin, and then um, yeah, that would okay. be great. Right. Uh, you know, I think you know we have been spending a, a, a significant amount of time, efforts, really building up the ESG management infrastructure. You know, um, our goal is to really be one of the best uh, you know practices in Asian market on that. Uh, so we are working very closely with excellent partners, and also I think one of the uh, um, to uh, one, one of the, uh, we're also working very closely with one of the most reputable DFS of the world, uh, our LP, um, you know, setting up that. We are pioneering uh, some efforts with the DFI LP uh, on things like a Paris Agreement alignment. It's the first time for them to really implement that on a GP level, on a fund level uh, in the Asian market. So we are pioneering that efforts in the Asian market with them right now. Um, so I think, you know, the challenge really comes from, I think when we, two folks, right? Number one is when we hold a, a bio stake or majority stake in the portfolio companies, it's relatively easier to collect all the data. But when we hold significant minority stake in the portfolio companies, uh, then it's not a, something very, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, then it's something you need to communicate upfront, right? So uh, how to solve that? I think we actually... Uh, put all those legal rights into the legal agreements uh, to make sure we have the board sees governance rights uh, and we make it very upfront with the, you know, uh, communicate very clearly with our portfolio companies. And more and more, I think, you know, our portfolio companies today, they really view this as a true value add for them as well. Okay, because they want to be viewed by their clients, by their uh, public investors, uh, by their, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, debt lenders, uh, being viewed as more ESG positive as well. And because of our strategy, they are really in that, you know, uh, a green energy, clean tax space, food security space. They are naturally generating very positive um, ESG impacts, right? I mean, but it's a question of um, how to measure that and how to report that. So I think when we do that with them, uh, you know, that's actually being viewed as a value add for our portfolio companies as well. Um, and I think, you know, in addition to, uh, you know, climate related factors, we're also spending a, a, a meaningful amount of time on really, um, you know, sustainability side, right? Uh, things like gender management. Well, we have uh, developed a gender scorecard for all of our portfolios <laughs> we're using right now. Um, you know, uh, uh, culture heritage, um, you know, all those, uh, you know, system sustainability factors are something quite important to us as well. So I think on that, uh, I would think, you know, uh, uh, we are all on this journey together um, mm -hmm. to really build up that, uh, you know, data collection infrastructure uh, and the standardized, uh, you know, monitoring system. And uh, hopefully, and we're doing that not only for our portfolio, for, for example, on the climate side, we're also monitoring the data. We're trying to standardize the data collection for, um, you know, uh, the carbon emission reduction they can achieve in their value chain for their clients, right? That's actually more, much more significant than the carbon emission they can achieve just in their own factory, right? Um, so I think, you know, that's really what we are doing right now. And Lane, actually, can I tack on uh, whilst whilst you take on this question about the investor manager relationship and reporting? Uh, but but you uh, you said that you set a, a net zero target um, for uh, net zero emissions by twenty thirty five with Linkrete. So um, it would be great to understand um, how that's 
um, how that's communicated and, and how the data is collected behind that. But I'm also particularly interested in the climate resilience planning you've done and how how um, how you're capturing data on on that. So thanks. Um, I think that. Oh, sorry, Calvin. <laughs> it's okay. <That's... laughs> um, so for the first part on the Netzo 2035. Uh, we know a lot of nations are setting 2050 uh, as targets, but that's because they're government. They need to set that really long-term target. We set ours at 2035 for a few reasons. Number one, it's still within the lifetime, a professional lifetime of, of the people that uh, are it, at Link right now. So that encourages us to have that accountability and ownership. Um, number two, because it's at 2035, we have 12 years to do this. And it also drives us to be a little bit more innovative in regards to thinking about what assets we're looking at, how do we consider it, um, what should we be looking at from the decarbonization side. Um, because the trajectory is nations are moving this direction, businesses are starting to get on board with this. And we know that by the time we get closer to 2050, even by, you know, let's say 2040, there's going to be a lot more costs involved with decarbonization. So the, what we're doing is challenging the team now to start figuring out what do we have to do um, and get ahead of the curve, uh, in a way, planning for the future. Uh, on the data management side, I've mentioned a little bit, the key focus here is to keep it simple. Okay, bring the, tighten the scope of the sustainability ESG data that we report on. Right now, we have upwards of 300 indicators, 300 data points. Um, and what we've done is actually apply three criteria to those data points. Number one, uh, is that uh, point material to the business? Okay. Number two, does it have an uh, impact on enterprise value or the balance uh, sheet? Okay. Uh, the, and the third one is, can it help us monitor greenwashing? And once we've applied those uh, three uh, criteria to that universe of 300, the 300 were from you know, the, the ESG benchmarks that are common. Um, we were able to cut those down to about 33 for management uh, oversight, and more importantly, uh, about 10 for the boards to review and boards to have oversight. Because in Hong Kong, SFC requires, uh, mandates that the board has to have oversight of ESG and sustainability strategy. Um, so by, by cutting it down from you know, 300 to 33 and then down for, to 9 for board oversight, we're able to present a little bit more uh, a kind of a tighter narrative on what is important to this business and how do these few indicators impact the business. Now, as we move forward, I think we'll expand those 10 uh, because this will be where the board becomes more comfortable with, uh, with where we're at. Uh, and then maybe other issues will come up that we can add on to this as well. The last point I'll say on this is um, with the point on data, uh, we do make our data uh, publicly available, uh, but we're also going through the process of getting it assured. Uh, and that is a initiative that's really being pushed from the European side, even to the point of how do you do stakeholder engagement? Um, so the assurance side is definitely going to be another area that is important for all the larger universe of data that we have. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's great that you brought up board oversight because we did have a question in the chat, how much focus do LPs have with respect to the application of action plans related to the governance side of, they say of asset managers, but also I'm assuming, you know, at portco level as well. So Lisa, let's, let's end with you. We've heard about Paris Agreement alignment, renewables investment, climate resilience planning. This all, I know, comes into the broader climate change transition plan that Aware Super has developed. Can you try and summarize what that entails in, in a couple of minutes, but also talk specifically to, to setting targets for, for, unlisted equity, for unlisted activity? Yeah, and I think it goes to that whole data point. I mean, you've got asset owners globally setting net zero 50 or 45% emission reduction targets by 2030. We can't do that alone if our fund managers aren't setting those targets or the companies in our portfolios aren't setting those targets. And then the companies aren't reporting what their scope one and two are for us to then be able to report that up and and, and be able to measure our portfolio. So um, apart from having to measure scope one and two across $160 billion um, in every market, in every um, asset class, um, that is a challenge in itself, but we did attempt to do that in 2020 and baseline our portfolio all on spreadsheets. Don't recommend it. Um, we have now um, been working with a, a partner in Australia called Path Zero with our um, private equity GPs for them to go in and put the data in themselves. And then they can then tell their other investors that are in their funds, here's the data as well. So it's then all in a system and we can aggregate it up at a portfolio level. So I think there's a market out there for a really good VC manager to then tack onto that for every other E and S and G data point we need to have in one system that we can then report 
support up at a portfolio level. Um, we've also tried to, you know, we, we talk a lot about outcomes and not just financial outcomes, but the outcomes that we're having with the investment decisions that we make. So we've developed a proprietary impact measurement framework for our real assets and so our alternatives, our property and infrastructure, and, and we're trying to measure that out those um, environmental and social outcomes um, and report on that. We've also been involved with an alliance, the Global Investors for Sustainable Development, where they de um, we developed a definition called sustainable development investing. And that gives us some clear guidance in terms of how we can map. Um, and we're doing it in our private market, so our alternatives, um, so we can communicate to our members where we're having impact in the portfolio. Now, we're not taking the whole portfolio and saying we have this impact. We're using that definition on transactions transaction by transaction um, and really looking at those other indicators. Our members do want to know what the impact is that we're having with the investments that we're making. So whether it's environmental outcomes or social outcomes as well. The main focus is environmental, but we need to get the data. We need to get the consistent data. Um, and it's really important that our GPs are asking the companies for that. Mm. Okay, well, that seems like a great way to, to wrap up. So I just want to say, Calvin, Lane, Lisa, Hayashi-san, thank you so much. It's so exciting to be in Japan, in the APAC region, to learn about the work you're doing and, and the, uh, uh, you know, it's specific to this region, but also uh, affecting kind of global um, practice and investor-manager dialogue. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. Thank you so much, Natasha, and thank you to our, our panelists. What an incredibly insightful uh, session. You've all been incredibly open in sharing your experience and your wealth of expertise. Uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, I just want to share with you all a new product that we are developing to support education and training, uh, and in this case, to support communication through the investment chain. Uh, we have our PRI Academy, which is online learning. We've been piloting and developing a new model of learning, which starts with a classroom session like this, where you hear from the experts, self-paced online learning to reinforce that, and then refresher sessions where you can come back, ask questions and work with the experts uh, to further explore uh, the training and its application in practice. So I'd invite you all to zap this QR code. Here, after this session, you will get access to a online module which looks specifically at selection appointments and monitoring of managers in alternative assets, how to improve communication and understanding through that supply chain. Uh, those of you who complete this module will also be invited back to a virtual session with one of our experts from PRI, when you can further explore, ask questions that have come up from this session, uh, and also your practical challenges in implementation. So I invite you all to zap this, and thank you very much for attending this session today.